Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm pleased to be joined again by Harvey Mansfield, Professor of Government at Harvard University. Always a pleasure, I'm getting to say. <laughs> you have to say that, right. <laughs> and uh, I thought we would discuss today your excellent essay, which made a big impression on me when I read it when it came out when I was in graduate school, Liberal Democracy as a, as a Mixed Regime. It's uh, appeared in the American Spectator, which was then called The Alternative, before it became more mainstream, I guess, and <laughs> became The American Spectator, and uh, was republished in your excellent book from 1978, I think, The Spirit of Liberalism. So people should look at the essay, but I thought it's it's not the book's out of print, unfortunately, and disgracefully, no. really, a terrible right. statement about the publishing profession that that's the case. Well, that's Harvard Press, so... Uh, well, so, yeah. yeah. That's All right. A, so. That's a decline at Harvard there. Yeah. And, um, and the essay, I... I happened to was reminded of it and looked at it recently and was struck by how interesting it is and since uh, though people can look at it online it's not uh, as accessible as some of your other work so I thought worth really walking people through it and we had a discussion recently about it and I thought other people also were at a seminar and other people as you know were very struck by the formulation so I mean mixed regime that sounds like Aristotle and <clears throat> Classical political philosophy and liberal democracy sounds like modern liberalism. So what's the what's That's the connection? That's just the idea. The title is a kind of paradox. It's, you know, um, I could say at the beginning that I was uh, working from the uh, with the advantage of uh, the understanding of Aristotle that I got from the PhD dissertation of my late wife uh, Delva Winthrop, uh, whose uh, dissertation, which is uh, called. Uh, Aristotle, Democracy, and Political Science has recently been published. So, uh, th so this is a kind of uh, simplified <laughs> uh, version of some of the things which she says on the basis of a much closer examination of, of Aristotle's text. But yes, um, mixed regime is Aristotle. Liberal democracy, that's us. And it doesn't seem to be a regime which is um, mentioned or featured uh, even in uh, in Aristotle's politics, uh, his book on politics. So, so what's on? So I, I I could begin by stating a problem in our understanding our, our, of uh, liberal democracy, which I think uh, is uh, and which I try to address through Aristotle. So first, this problem: if you look at the liberal democracy which we live in right now, it seems to be divided divided into people who run things and who have ambition and who desire to be outstanding in some way and people who don't. Um, sometimes known in the political science literature as uh, ordinary voters, a somewhat condescending designation. Right. Um, ordinary voters, and ordinary voters sit back and they choose the rulers who then rule them. Only it's not called ruling, it's called representation. Right. And so that uh, the uh, ordinary voters are, so to speak, given the impression that this is their government. They're, in fact, ruling, but, in fact, but as you look at it, it isn't. <laughs> the people who are doing the ruling are, are these ambitious types. Uh, I go to, I teach at Harvard, and I see a lot of Harvard students. They're full of this ambition. They like to use the word impact. Right. <laughs> Ugly word. Yeah. And that's what they want to have on the world, an impact on the world, and that's ambition. And it, take, of course, can take many different forms, but uh, they all seem to sort of, uh, sort of coalesce in a single type so that our liberal democracy is divided into the liberals, I'm going to call them the, the ambitious ones, and they are uh, fewer than the ordinary voters, many, many fewer, and then the ordinary voters who are the many and who uh, don't see the point in being ambitious. They want a secure life and they don't uh, they sort of think of themselves as uh, in a niche. They don't uh, want to. They may want to improve their standard of living, but they don't uh, seek to be on top. 
and to run things in the way that uh, the others do, so that our liberal democracy seems to be divided uh, between the few and the many. And that's what Aristotle would say, and what I think uh, and, and somebody just coming to our politics and looking at it without uh, knowing much about its principles would say too. Uh, and, and the trouble is that it's uh, this d division between the few and the many on the basis of ambition is not the way uh, liberal democracy looks at itself. Not at all. And the big difference is that the liberals, the ambitious types, look on themselves as uh, Democrats. They're not, they, uh, they, they uh, don't all belong to the Democratic Party, but the Republicans too among us also think of themselves as Democrats, as part of the people and who are selected by the people and not rulers over the people. And you see this in American political science, which is also uh, reflects the self-understanding of, of, um, of liberal de democracy. Um, they, um, uh, they refer, as I said, to ordinary voters, and they also refer, they use the word elite, a very common word, <laughs> everybody, every, everybody knows that there are elites which exist, but the trouble is that the elite doesn't look on itself as an elite, and the elite spends a lot of its time attacking elitism, as if there were a kind of ism that went with uh, being uh, on top. Uh, that was unattractive and shameful, not something, you know, say, I'm a member of the elite, thank you. <laughs> And uh, so that's something not to be and an impression not to give. So um, political science um, conveys this or, um, uh, with its notion of a causal mechanism. And now we're going to get into what, how Aristotle comes in. Okay. That, uh, yeah, because I think so far one could say sociologists, Marxists, Machiavellians, I mean, all of them would understand that society consists of these, of the many and the few, more or less, right? I mean, the sort of the either exploited a la Marx or yes. Machiavelli's case, more of a right. uh, yeah. distinction of character or yeah. sociologist study elites. Yeah, well, some of those, like the Marxists, do look forward to a, a, demo an e That's a, true, a totally yeah. equal democracy way off in the future. So they would still. But it's true, uh, it's, it's not uncommon to see this uh, distinction between uh, the equals and the, and the unequals, but in such a way that uh, the, the ascendancy of the unequals is not justifiable. Right. There's no Whereas Aristotle you, gives you us that it's justifiable. Right, <laughs> yeah. so that's the... Yeah. So, and, that, and that it's also a, a form of rule, rule and not just um, representation. Now, the political science t talks about these causal mechanisms, which means that uh, a thing is caused by um, its um, uh, preceding cause. A uh, cause precedes the effect, as uh, in the famous case of bi a billiard balls. When you strike a billiard ball, it moves according to the motion that has been given to it, and it hits according to the laws of motion hits what it hits, other, other balls, right. and goes in the pocket. And so uh, that, that, that's sort of what Aristotle would call efficient causation, and this is what uh, the kind of causation that you get in modern natural science. So that this political science looks at, looks at science as natural science, and it doesn't make a distinction with human things. And therefore, uh, the notion of intention is lacking from its um, causal mechanism. A thing doesn't happen because you intend it to happen. That isn't what, uh, how you explain the behavior of a billiard ball. You don't need that. But um, uh, how do you understand ambition as uh, being caused by something outside it? Well. You just say that ambition is uh, 
is uh, uh, is just a thing which uh, uh, improves your career, and your career gives you more of what ever satisfaction. It's a kind of quantity. It gives you, it gives you more, and they don't want to really specify what the more is more of. And so uh, they usually don't talk about ambition, but when they do, it's always in the form of careerism, as if it were a kind of self-promotion. But if you look at an ambition, ambitious person, <laughs> they don't understand themselves as, yes, I, I want to be in on it, but I want to have an imp impact on the world, remember? So and that mean and that means you have uh, it, you, you, your concern is not merely in, or even mainly with yourself, but it's on uh, the rest of the world, and you you want to extend yourself to the rest of the world, and that's beginning to give you the idea of ruling. So now let's uh, uh, turn to Aristotle, and Aristotle when he looks at politics looks at, at it fundamentally from the standpoint of the few and the many that um, there is always that difference between the few who want to rule and the many who also want to rule but differently and the few want to rule to justify their fewness or whatever it is and uh, the many their manyness, and this usually takes the form of money or wealth, that the many uh, represent the, or are the poor, <laughs> because it just works out <laughs> that, that the, <clears throat> most people are poorer and few, a few people are wealthier. That was true in Aristotle's day, and it seems still to be true today. So, uh, empirical fact, something uh, in nature, or, or I suppose. So that um, this, the, the, you've got a difference then between the poor and the rich, but it isn't such a great difference because what you're saying is that the poor and the rich want the same thing. They both want more, see? and they don't know what the more is. Well, it's more money. Money is fungible. What are you going to do with your money? What is the purpose of having wealth? Well, uh, it's the purpose is to have an improved life. <laughs> so now you're beginning to go from more to a definition of more. You're beginning to go from a quantity to a quality. And there are... Um, um, so, if you want um, um, more quality, then perhaps uh, it's possible to have less of a competition or less instability, because uh, the poor, as poor, always want to exploit the rich, and the rich, as rich, always want to exploit the poor, and there's nothing holding them back, and they would go after each other. <laughs> I yeah. guess they could split the Hammer difference. Hammer and togs, so right? Yeah. yeah. No, they, they wouldn't be willing to split the difference <laughs> because you always want more. So, and there's nothing in the, in the, no in the equation. Principle. There's nothing, no limiting principle. The limiting principle comes, say, when you look at just more life, a better life, or a longer life. And, but life is also has a kind of quantitative aspect <coughs> and you mean when you say that a human life that's a human life a human life is a life belonging to a certain species which uh, is really an arist aristocratic uh, species and the rest of nature we're the only uh, species that is aware can be aware of itself and aware of the world which is ambition which has ambitions <laughs> which has intentions which has intelligence. So um, we're kind of aristocracy, but then as humans, we're a kind of democracy. 
that uh, every human has the natural equipment of a human being, which includes rationality, reasons you can understand, you can talk, you can uh, think, you can uh, suffer, feel, um, enjoy. So these are all human things. Those are all qualities. So you can uh, see already then, too, that there's a difference between certain democratic qualities and certain and aristocratic qualities. Aristocrats are tough. They're tense. If you're ambitious, you want to accomplish something. You, to accomplish something, you have to push yourself. You have to use your stress. Stress is a good thing if you want to be ambitious. It's not a bad thing, of course, as it is, generally speaking, according to modern psychology. Um, whereas uh, the many are softer, more tender, more receptive. You begin to you see some of Aristotle's metaphysics here, that the forms, so the, the things with more definition impose themselves, invisible things impose themselves on matter, which receives those forms, which is, there's a human matter and then there's a human form. And uh, the human form seems to be located more in the few and the receptivity to it in the many. So that's already uh, Aristotle's sort of you know, metaphysical look. And those, you could say, uh, represent the liberals and the democrats that we saw back in uh, in in uh, liberal democracy. So we're beginning to get some sense of human dignity and of the differences uh, between humans, too, that uh, some of them have this ambition and some of them sort of are much more intelligent than others. We all have intelligence qua humans, but there's a terrific difference in, um, in intelligence, was a, which as you could say is a kind of natural um, aristocracy. So wealth is no longer the standard, and the standard is now something not quite visible. It is, it is you can infer it from human behavior that there are these differences in intelligence, say. But um, what an intelligent human being is, uh, you have to define, you can get examples of it, but uh, the examples are not as important as the definition, which is invisible. So the qualities are not visible in the same way that, that, uh, that, uh, that human beings have in, in the same way that uh, uh, behavior is. Although, as I say, there are these kind of transitional qualities like uh, tough, mm -hmm. tense versus uh, s soft and tender, which go on the way from quantity to, to quality. So, uh, it, and, the, and these two uh, tendencies, so the poor and the rich, don't have any, as I say, inherent uh, motion towards uh, a limit or a mix, something which would uh, allow them to live together in harmony. So that has to be introduced by intelligence, and that means by a political scientist or a philosopher. And Aristotle gives three different ways in which um, the poor and the rich might be mixed. And the first way is to just have the poor and the rich, as, as we began, uh, together, and both, both there, not the poor over the rich, but just, uh, and nor the rich over the poor, but just there. And that you could call democracy. That's a kind of democratic mix, because every, everybody is represented and included. The rich as rich, and the poor as poor, or and that's a, that's so that's a democratic mix. Or or another mix would be to find 
a middle position between poor and rich. So the middle class, and this would add a certain stability. And the middle class are afraid of being poor, and they're also afraid that the rich will take over from them. So they are always looking from both sides like this, they're in the middle. That's the in-between position. And that's a sort of oligarchical mix because the middle class are, take on the attributes of an oligarchy, um, defending themselves from, from both sides. But then there's a third mix, and this is the true mix, and that's a mix which transcends wealth and doesn't try merely to split the difference on the basis of wealth, but goes to another thing altogether, and that's virtue. So virtue becomes something which transcends both um, poor and rich. And Aristotle has a list of 11 moral virtues, which he gives you in the Nicomachean Ethics. So the first two are courage and moderation. I won't try to <laughs> remember all the uh, uh, other 11, other nine, but uh, th th that's, that's good enough to start with those two, just to give you an idea of what he means, so that some people are courageous. And, uh, and to be courageous or, and or moderate. Those are especially the virtues of the body. Courage uh, is the virtue that helps you deal with fears. If you're afraid of something, always afraid that you need some courage. Moderation helps you with the pleasures of the body. So then you can be tempted into wrong pleasures or too much pleasure or even too little if you're that type. Right. kind of person who has an apple for lunch say. Mm -hmm. uh, not enough <laughs> so um, uh, no martini not, not, no, the principle is one martini not none not two so, I, don't remember so that from, I don't remember that from Aristotle yeah that's so, yeah. Yeah, that's my <laughs> little uh, You're yeah my working 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 uh, <laughs> example of <laughs> of what moderation means, so that uh, so you get the idea that uh, uh, just because uh, the virtue is a virtue doesn't mean that it's uh, ascetic or uh, are, are opposed to any idea of pleasure. pleasure. Yeah. All right, so that, th those are the virtues, and those virtues are ordered in a certain way in the regime, and the regime calls for certain virtues. And the, the, uh, the, the most famous ancient polis was Sparta, which was ordered for the, so all for the sake of courage. And in general, the Greeks and the Greek cities were, were much more martial, much more dedicated to war, to the necessities of war, and to the virtues which are needed are displayed most in war than are ours today. So, frequent comparison of um, modern philosophers like Montesquieu. The, uh, we, we today are devoted to commerce and peace, and they were devoted to the virtues, and especially martial virtue, which uh, called for sacrifice to the common good in a way that commerce does not. So this uh, ordering um, can lead in regime to the separation of powers. So we have our separation of powers, as explained in the Federalist. Okay. Yeah, and those, so those those powers are three faculties of the soul. It's one thing to judge and be a judge, another to be a legislator, uh, and a third to be uh, an executive to, to run things. And they each have different lives that go together with uh, what they do. So a judge uh, talks with other judges, but especially lives uh, close to the law. He has to know what the law says, and then to interpret the law, and to find uh, a way of understanding the law which applies to a particular case. And so he usually s sits and reads talks to a few people, and if, if he's on a court, uh, maybe uh, participates 
in a deliberation, a deliberation like the Supreme Court. Uh, whereas a legislator doesn't take the law as given because he's thinking in terms of an, making a new law. So he looks on the present law as the status quo, and the status quo doesn't have any special authority as it does in judging. So, um, and in order to legislate, he needs to talk to a lot of other people and of different kinds. And so his day is spent in talking to lobbyists and, mm -hmm. and to uh, advocates and to fellow representatives or senators uh, to see how we can get a majority together, how he can represent his district, but also do something that's for everybody's good. It's a lot of addition and subtraction looking for a majority who have to be more, much more congenial type than as a judge. And then the third is the, man, uh, the managing that uh, an executive does. He runs things, so, so, and he decides. And uh, he's much closer to what might be called just ruling, <laughs> right. to choosing a, a policy and um, seeing that it gets accomplished. So he's interested in the effect, the execution, the carrying out. Uh, so um, th th this is the way in which uh, our separation of powers can be understood as uh, an ordering of the soul because those are activities of the soul, judging and legislating uh, and uh, executing. And if you look at the Federalist, it first describes a separation of powers in terms of their separation and, um, and the fact that they must be made equal, no one of them superior to the rest, and how, that, how it's necessary to make them counteract. So this, uh, that's the word which is especially used, action and counteraction. So mm -hmm. government is generally characterized as Action and counteraction, those two go together, and that very much comes from Montesquieu, that all power needs to be checked by other power. So, ba balance. And so. But, so that draws your attention away from the actual, what, what the different parts are actually doing. Right. And those are maybe more difficult to define, as we see in Federalist number 37, they talk about the difficulty of defining them powers of, but then at the, at the end of the Federalist, or the last half of it, when the actual different branches of government are discussed, it comes out that uh, they do different things and um, may perhaps uh, have an, um, a different intention than merely checking one another. Right. They want to accomplish something, namely good government. So that uh, Republican government is a good government. But the intention or character of the powers yeah. in the Federalists is sort of backed into or, or hidden a little bit. Yes, yeah. As implied by the lists of... You showed that very well in well, your PhD well, I dissertation. I it, it, it was I remember puzzling that. to me, I mean, that, that yeah. how much it's... Right. Why they don't want to say more explicitly. Yeah. Sort of now let's come back to Aristotle and um, look at this um, situation of a mixed government. Now, he also remarks that uh, to get to this mix, you have to have some understanding of freedom. And uh, he finds his understanding of freedom to come from the democratic claim because uh, you've got your soul and your body your soul decides on certain things which are rational, intelligent to do, but your body resists often. Whereas, as when you do something <laughs> that you know is wrong, <laughs> but nonetheless you go ahead and uh, and do it. So there's a certain resistance to intelligence that's characteristic of humans, <laughs> as well as the intelligence. This is often left out by scientists when they're talking about the characteristics of, of the human species. 
they forget that, yes, we're intelligent, but we also resist intelligence. Uh, for example, when somebody claims to be wise and wiser than you are, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to obey what he says because you think, well, hmm, uh, um, how does that affect me? How does it look to me? And that's really, when you say that me, you're especially talking about your body, the most private part of you, that which you control yourself and nobody else does. And to some extent, therefore, your body controls you. And, so, uh, you, and your body can be understood as claiming freedom from your intelligence, your wisdom, or the wisdom of wise people. And uh, the body, the claims of the body are especially close to democracy because democracy means all as equal and all human bodies are much more equal or, uh, in, their, in their desire, each of them, to be right. one's own, to have, one, to, to have one's own and to promote that than um, your soul or in, or in, which is dominated by your intelligence. So the democratic claim to freedom comes exactly, precisely from, you might say, the quantity of your body, <laughs> which is rather, it comes back to uh, the importance of the fact that we not only are, have intelligence, but we have, <laughs> so to speak, anti-intelligence built in. And so to your soul, there's a kind of resistance, it's a battle that goes on in your soul between your body and your, and your smarts or your intelligence. Um, and um, and and so this this is uh, this is a, a better and fuller description. It also begins to justify democracy a little bit more than you might guess from the superiority of of intelligence. Okay. So so democracy is, is desire to rule freely. Now that you see that the Democrats are no longer just poor. They have a, they make a certain claim to uh, to rule. <coughs> the oligarchs also make claims that the best should rule, and um, they're they pushed into by Aristotle, the political scientist, pushed into redefining wealth as wealth of things that are good. Wealthy things are are what makes you good. So your wealth could even be understood as your intelligence. So that's uh, your equipment, or what you have, either from nature or from what you've learned from your learning, your education. So uh, politics then it consists of a of a competition of claims, claims to justice, justice, the good of the commonality of the community. So injustice is again an invisible quality. It can be defined, but it can't be seen except in certain great actions. So um, where these are our claims to justice are often expressed in the um, appreciation and reverence even that we give to great figures, great human beings. So in America, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, so people of that quality in there, and we learn about how they lived and what they did that inspires us to, to way above sort of the common or ordinary voter or the ordinary possibility or even the ordinary ambitious person, right. way above them. But still, it's something that we need. It's, a, it's something which is our very best that holds us together as a community. And if we lost that, or changed that, <coughs> changed uh, our appreciation for George Washington to say, to somebody like a Napoleon, then that would totally change the nature of our community. So this mix which uh, uh, has an existence in the soul of the best man, 
uh, perhaps not even better than George Washington, but somebody who understands George Washington, <laughs> as I said, as he sees all the wonderful things that he did in the circumstances that he faced. That, um, but uh, but who understands this, and uh, this understanding is reflected in uh, George Washington's The Noble Deeds of the City, and also in the, the worshiping or the civil religion of, um, of the city. And all this amounts to a, a kind of uh, a, a, a speculation or in, uh, of, of what, is, uh, what is best and, uh, what, and what is virtuous, at least within the reach of, of most of us. So um, the moral virtues um, are a way of looking at the actions of the body, which presupposes that there's a soul behind them, which presupposes that you are capable voluntarily of choosing to do the right thing. Right. Yeah. So um, it, it doesn't prove that that soul exists, but it uh, the way we understand it suggests that we believe right. <laughs> that there is such a soul. Now let's come back to liberalism, comp applying all this modern mixed regime as opposed to Aristotle's. So the modern mixed regime says that we are all equal. And it begins that from this famous state of nature of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Um, there is, however, we're all, we means all of us humans, so there is a kind of the same superiority of human beings to the rest of the world, which is non-human, um, animal or you know, just inanimate. So, um, human beings have this capacity to master or even conquer the nature of uh, the non-human world. Um, but how is it going to do this? So how, how are we going to live in such a way as to show that we're all equal and um, at the same time to show that we're superior to our nature? And the answer is uh, through acquisition or economics or uh, commerce. Uh, acquisition, that's Machiavelli. In commerce, say that's later, that's Locke, Hume, Montesquieu, uh, the econ economic man. In other words, we must uh, overlook or not talk about the soul or about intention, but devote ourselves to the gaining of more without trying to define more what, as Aristotle wants us to do. And that means that um, human beings are equal because the body is primary. If the, it's only if the body is primary that we can all understand ourselves as equal. And the body can be primary only if we, we forget about or suppress the notion of soul which includes this notion of intention or of voluntary action that you do something freely. So it's freely, it's freedom now understood sort of in a diluted way as released so, rather than as aiming at something and having the power to aim at an intention, at a goal. And, and this means that democracy and oligarchy, which are claims to rule in Aristotle, become these two things of liberal democracy. Democrats who uh, live their ordinary lives and liberals who were dissatisfied with that, who couldn't live unless they were outstanding or extraordinary in some way they could explain to themselves is is better. So the Democrats, instead of being rulers, 
claiming freedom turn into beneficiaries of the acquisitions and uh, sort of wealth getting of the liberals, understanding these liberals um, as, um, as, as simply the ambitious. So, and then there, the party conflict which we have is not between Democrats and oligarchs, but within the liberals, within the oligarchs, so to speak. Because the liberals have the have the duty, or you might say the human um, function of assertion, of self-assertion, of promoting themselves, and they do. Uh, the, the result of this is beneficial to the rest of uh, of the of the community, so which doesn't otherwise would relax and not do anything. So. Um, Self, the self-assertion of the oligarchs is no longer simply oligarchical, but it benefits the democracy as a whole. As when wealthy people get wealthy, they can't do that without improving the standard of living of, of, of the consumers and so on. So government is um, um, not a cure for souls. It's not a... Uh, um, it, it, it's not a, uh, a way of mixing the qualities of one's soul. And this came out of the way in which uh, liberalism got started. Liberalism got started as an attack uh, on the soul because the soul, it thought, had been misinterpreted, appropriated, and abused by the priests of Christianity. So that Aristotle's... Uh, strange uh, doctrine, soulful doctrine, had been picked up by Christianity, and uh, the Aristotelian soul had been made into a Christian soul, and the Christian soul was something that could be manipulated by Christian priests, because priests talk to God in a way that the rest of us don't, and they tell us what God wants us to do, and this is a kind of indirect form of tyranny. They, in fact, are doing the, the, the ruling, but they're pretending that uh, they're merely executing the will of God. And sort of modern representative government is a kind of secularized version of this indirect government that uh, our leaders, whom we can now call them leaders, not rulers, um, whom we elect, uh, tell us what to do but they say that this is what we wanted when we chose them. So your, your tax, taxes, are, they take money away from you. That's perfectly justified because you wanted it. And when you voted for us, <laughs> you voted for these exactions and troubles and, uh, and all, the, all, the, all the, so the, so this famous statement of, of Hobbes, uh, the, the, uh, the criminal is the author of his own punishment. All right. So, so, all right. But you get to so, vote them out, so yeah. there's a certain uh, accountability which there isn't in the right. in Christianity, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> so, right. so um, uh, but there is this uh, famous uh, division among the quote liberals unquote that I'm, I'm, I'm a word which I'm using much more generally than it's yes. usually used I'm using it just to mean all ambitious types in a liberal democracy uh, but those types are divided but especially it's between businessmen and intellectuals and this is a distinction which was introduced by Rousseau I think mainly who identified the businessmen as the bourgeoisie and those are people who are not uh, real citizens. They are town dwellers. That's what's, what's the literal meaning of bourgeois. Uh, town dwellers who have their freedom because the king gave it to them. And so they don't have the real freedom. The real freedom is the freedom that you give to yourselves. So this is this crit critique of the, of the bourgeoisie was picked up and turned into a great distinction between um, those 
who are ambitious by getting wealth and those who are ambitious by getting reputation through speech, intellectuals. Intellectuals are people who are smarter than the rest of us and who show it by publishing. So no, publication is necessary to an intellectual. It's not necessary to a philosopher, as we know from the case of Socrates, right. great, the greatest philosopher of all, never published. Um, but um, an intellectual publishes, so he, sh he advertises to the world his intellect as a form of uh, ruling, you could say, and, uh, and a businessman. Uh, and, the, and the thing is that the two of them hate each other. So the businessmen look down on, this, on these uh, intellectuals as being snobs and, and people who uh, could never meet a payroll. I think there, there are these two great achievements in life. You're a, if, if you're a businessman, you can run a payroll. And if you're an intellectual, you can teach and you can run a class. Okay. So mm -hmm. a, a businessman would be as much a, 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 at a loss in a classroom as an intellectual would be in the office of a manager. <laughs> neither of them could do the other. And neither of them are just, <laughs> they, they <laughs> attack each other. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, if that's really true, uh, yeah. And then there may be a third class of politicians. Or but anyway, so this is uh, the way in which um, liberals uh, or liberal democracy becomes um, invisible to itself, that it wants to understand itself as coming out of human equality and human equality only, so that inequalities have no justifiable separate status. And this leads to all the problems of authority under liberal democracy. There doesn't seem to be any justified way in which I should obey you. You should have authority over me. And so people get the very exaggerated notions of autonomy on the one hand. And uh, on the other hand, they want to help out other people and uh, they do that by making them beneficiaries. But to make someone your beneficiary is to patronize that person, take away his, uh, his sense that he runs his own life. And so you make them feel as if they don't have any standing, no separate justification. Things are pushed onto them, so-called benefits, which they don't care for and, t and tend to resist in this elemental uh, resistant freedom resistance that that humans have, so you get this d division between uh, licentious types who don't know wh <laughs> when something is wrong <laughs> and uh, lazy or idle people who are benefited but resent the benefits. Or the, and, or, and especially the benefactors, they're so-called, they hate the elites that uh, they get everything from. And the elites uh, despise so this, m the multitude. So this liberal mix of liberal democracy is always in this, in danger of subsiding into the corruption of, uh, of lack of virtue lack of the understanding of virtue. So I suppose the business party, let's say the Republicans, their corruption would be to simply be oligarchs, I guess, in the, in the normal sense of oligarchs and have no sense of no, no responsibility. responsibility. And right. the intellectuals would become... Also no sense of responsibility. Right. And, and they would just... Indulge uh, all their ideas. Yeah, and regardless of the harm they might do thereby. So it's important that each of those class of liberals, if you want to call them that, or elites, yeah. you know, has a bit of an understanding of the hole in which they operate, not just that's right. Even they if they're pretty and then, and this focused whole, on their uh, own work, yeah. And you, this you hole know. is much better explained to them by Aristotle. Well, that's uh, so they begin to see why they uh, why there is such a thing as soul, and why there is such a thing, why and why liberals tend to deny it. So. And, uh, and do you? Th but the liberals, you know, 
how much are you import? I guess I'm, you're improving the kind of understanding of the mixture of, of liberal democracy as a mixed regime from the liberal understanding to an Aristotelian understanding. That's right. A fair yeah. way of saying it. I yes, mean, yeah. But that's so necessary. They, that's they not just yeah. willful on no. your part or no, something. No, no, it's not an imp- Oh, no, it's not an imposition of mine. Right. It's, uh, yeah. You're it's, seeing uh, what's there. Yeah. I'm telling you, yeah, what, <laughs> what's there what's, and what's there is Aristotle, um, to use one word. But, um, yeah, so I tried, and then Aristotle understands liberalism better than liberals. Too. That's what I'm saying. And, and the yeah. early liberals who set this all up yeah. sort of understood it. Yes. They understood the step they were taking because they saw better what Aristotle meant. And they th- thought they saw what was, was the danger in Aristotle. And no doubt that danger exists. So I don't, I don't think it was unknown to Aristotle. <laughs> there, there isn't a human life without danger. The appropriation of soul for, yeah, the appropriation of soul for kind of divine right tyranny. But you think it's important to recur, so to speak, to Aristotle. Yes. Now, because otherwise we just forget the kind of yeah, the, the really the right way to mix these elements yes. and to you forget what the early modern philosophers knew, not just what Aristotle knew. So you forget you need you forgot that you forget the reason for original. Uh, defining reason for liberal democracy, which which was an attack on the soul, or the need, this the felt need, perceived need, misperceived need, maybe for an attack on the soul. But you need to bring the soul yeah. back now, because otherwise it yeah it gets yeah. so and liberal inc- democracy as, can't as, survive. Yes, a, this includes uh, an Aristotelian uh, Aristotelian appreciation for religion. So this is, and I mean, this is all, all altogether without refer, uh, referring or basing one's uh, understanding on religion. That would be a separate argument uh, yeah. against our, or to, in, in a, as an improvement over liberal democracy. But I'm I'm uh, presenting the Aristotelian one. And these, and finally, these politicians need to understand a little more than the businessmen and the intellectuals yes to sort of manage the right the yeah. the tripartite the people the yeah businessmen and the intellectuals to manage that mixing properly and yeah they they have to they, you know, they have to see the separateness of those functions but also what what they're aiming at and what they both lack which is an appreciation of of virtue so it's virtue that's missing. Uh, it's virtue that's missing. Along with the soul. Yes, yeah, along with the soul. But should, the, so. should virtue and the soul be brought back explicitly, I guess, is my final question? Or, I mean, would you recommend that yeah. people, politicians talk about this particularly, or is this somehow to guide them, but to let the businessmen be businessmen and let the intellectuals be intellectuals? And, or is there a problem with just letting it all play out in a kind of... In a way that's yeah, in which there's no explicit. Yeah, if you record. try to bring back the soul explicitly, you'll encounter opposition from the intellectuals, who s- who still remember uh, the right. or say might say the origin of liberalism, or have some awareness of it. Uh, but maybe maybe we need to do that. Certainly, Tocqueville, uh, at the beginning of Democracy in America, in the introduction refers to the degraded souls hmm. of uh, people in, this is, he's talking not so much in America as in Europe. And, uh, the democracy, it, it, with its inability to justify authority of any kind, can de- de- lead to degraded souls. So I, I, th- I think uh, I would give it a try. And I think you couldn't Look up to the kind of forms of greatness that you th- said earlier yeah. are so important. That's but right. Some understanding, obviously, that it's more than just a quantitative difference, so to speak. Yes. Which between Lincoln yeah. and the rest of us, which and that our our science of psychology needs to make 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 room for the soul. Good. Yeah. Well, that's an ambitious uh, undertaking for uh-huh. a bit of a very ambitious essay, which I'm glad we discussed and we went. Uh, I mean, it is. 
more, about more ultimately than I think this particular regime and this and businessmen and intellectuals. You've given us a kind of a, a bit of a history of political philosophy and certainly an account of Aristotle that's very, mm-hmm. and, if it's re- and of the relevance of Aristotle, I would say, that's mm-hmm. unusual and helpful, but it requires more thinking and work, so, which we will all do. All right, thank which you. Our, that's a, which, our, yeah. which our viewers will do. That's enough praise. Yeah, that was more than enough. Not more than enough, but enough, <laughs> yes, a just right. amount. Harvey Mansfield, thank you for joining right. me today thank to you. discuss this excellent essay, Liberal Thanks Democracy in a Mixed me. Regime, and to right. go really beyond the essay itself. Uh, and thank you for joining us in Conversations.